Welcome to the Witty and Gritty Podcast, where we believe that lifelong learning and relentless determination are essential to developing your passions and reaching your goals. Here to help you along the way are the hosts of the show. Take it away, ladies. Hey, y'all. I'm Brooke. And I'm Farron. As educators and high achievers, we're passionate about providing our listeners with effective strategies to help navigate life's obstacles and reach your goals sooner. Join us as we break down credible research that gives you a fresh perspective and challenges your limiting beliefs. Laugh and grow as we share personal anecdotes and interviews from people that have demonstrated what it takes to be successful. By implementing these practices, you will develop your unique skill set and learn how to better serve your community. Get your mind right. And enjoy this time designed just for you. Farron, it's a new mini-series. Ah. Fresh and hot out the oven. <laughs> so we're actually, uh, we just wrapped up our Atomic Habits mini-series, and we thought this was the next perfect book to go along with changing your mind, your habits, building all those kind of skills. So it's international bestseller, and it's called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do by Amy Morin. Yes, and the tagline is, take back your power, embrace change, face your fears, and train your brain for happiness and success. So we have done some brain training mini-series like Switch on Your Brain and this Atomic Habits one we just finished. And so this just perfectly goes along with it. So if you don't know who Amy Morin is, you should definitely follow her on Instagram. She is a therapist and she has got quite the story. So make sure, this is one of the books, so we'll link the book in the show notes. But make sure you read the introduction because she tells you about why she is qualified to write this book through her own experiences. This was actually a viral blog post that she posted a few years ago, and she didn't realize how powerful the, the post was going to be. And so then she decided, I think I'm just going to write a book about this with examples and stories and all that kind of stuff. Yes. I like, too, that the pre- premise is 13 things not to do, because we, I think, all agree on what we should do, but... I don't know that we always stop and realize we need to stop doing what we are doing. Right. It's not just, here, add this to your plate, but here's some things you also need to stop doing. Right. So I really like that aspect of the book. But like you said, Brooke, Brooke and book, those all sound the same, (laughs) Uh, that she has a a really impactful story, um, and there are several stories throughout this. So as always, we do encourage you to get your own copy of the book. Um, So that way you can get into all that. We'll touch on a few, but there's just so many good ones. How do you choose? Right, exactly. So a little bit about her background and her story. Her mom suddenly died. This was when she was a young adult. And so three years later, she and her husband were going to, they did a memorial for her kind of thing by doing what they did three years ago on the night that she died, which was go watch a basketball game. And then on their way home from the game, her husband was complaining of severe back pain and then they took him to the hospital, and he ended up dying from a heart attack. So she's like, um, on the three-year anniversary of my mom's death, my husband also suddenly died. Both these people were super healthy, just out of nowhere, gone. So this kind of sparked this in her mind on, okay, I've got to healthily move forward. This is what my job is anyway, so now I have this whole life experience to back up what I'm saying. So she took some good notes on what she did. And now we have this book. Yes, power through it, Enneagram number sixes. Yes. Do not start fearing, you know, spontaneous death. There is a lot to come from this book, so push through or just skip that part. Just go to chapter one. I often don't read the introduction because reading is a lot, and so if I get to skip any pieces, hey... That just means I get a start on page 17. What? Spoken like a true nine. I'm already 17 pages into the book. What page are you on? (laughs) One sucker. Oh, that is funny. So There you go. There's my tip for Enneagram 6. It's just (laughs) chapter one. There you go. And even right before chapter one, she has a little section that's, what is mental strength? So we talk about mental toughness all the time. So this is a little bit... It's not just, oh, just be tough and suck it up, buttercup. It's more of like, how are we training ourselves to be stronger, whether it's mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all that stuff. So she's tying in becoming stronger instead of just trying to tough it out. So that's where that distinction comes from. And in the beginning, she does have she does have the psychology background. We have a little bit of a psychology background as well. She talks about how 
your life experiences, your genetics, and your personality kind of make up who you are and set you up for your mental strength baseline. So you get to choose from there what you're going to do with that. Yeah, I like how she says, developing mental strength is about improving your ability to regulate your emotions, manage your thoughts, and behave in a positive manner. Here's the kicker. Despite your circumstances. And through all the people we've interviewed and all the books we've covered, um, it, the idea that I feel keeps coming up is you want to work on this before you need it. Right. Um, same thing with your prayer life. That comes up a lot in the interviews. You want to prepare as much as you can because when you're in those moments, um, they will grow you and you will get through them. But you want to prepare for whatever circumstances you might find yourself in, even the good ones. Right. Like I, some people will self-sabotage when they find themselves just like accelerating and growing at this, mm-hmm. you know, awesome rate, but they don't know what to do. <laughs> right. Or they're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Just, oh, so daring greatly are that mini series episodes 28 through 38. Brene Brown talks about your foreboding joy. So you have all this going for you and you're just sitting there like, okay, well it's going to end any minute instead of, Why don't I enjoy every minute? So it's that mindset shift, too. Exactly. So um, working on your mental strength, I think, needs to be an ongoing and conscious effort. Um, Same thing we like to work out around here. So if you are lifting weights or training for a marathon, like if you don't keep up your training, you will get out of shape. So um, I used to think, like, someday I'll just be strong enough. And I've realized in my older, wiser years, it's an (laughs) ongoing training in a sense. So I'm really excited. If you know a lot about mental toughness and um, a growth mindset, there's still going to be some fresh ideas in this book and ways for you to grow. And sometimes I have to hear things like seven or eight times and then Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I've never heard that before. No, it clicks. Does anyone out there have a husband that does that? Or children. (laughs) Yeah. You never told me. Uh, I told you 17 times. I'll tell you again. Maybe you need 18. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, So yes, I like how she also talks about that balance between your emotions and your rational thinking. So speaking to the more emotionally charged people out there, making decisions based off of logic and reason as opposed to what feels good in the moment. So there's that. So keep all of that in mind. And she does have a section in here that, again, still before chapter one, that talks about the truth about mental strengths. And she goes on and gives several points Um, One of them is being mentally strong isn't about acting tough. You don't have to become a robot or appear to have a tough exterior when you're mentally strong. Instead, it's about acting according to your values. So we're going to tie a lot of verses and themes like that into this book as well. I believe in the intro she talks about being a believer. So there's that. Okay, so another point she made in the same section was that mental strength isn't synonymous with mental health. And so that was one thing I struggled with is like, I'd feel like I was mentally strong, but would still deal with anxiety or depression. And so she basically, I don't know, I always take it as getting permission to be able to be both at the same time. Um, But what stuck out to you about that? Um, I kind of like what you said, you might have um, like your genetics or there's a line of history in your family. But again, that doesn't need to be your crutch. And that's where we're going to walk through some of this, too. It's, yes, just because your mom had depression doesn't mean you can't break free from this. And that makes me think of episode 91 with Casey Coates, where he talks about anxiety and all that jazz. So if you struggle with anxiety, depression, episode 91 with Casey Coates will certainly kickstart you there. So the outline of the book, I... I like it. It has a good flow. Of course, there's good stories all throughout, like we mentioned. But there's also a checklist through each chapter. Like, is this you? Is this a thing that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing? And then the negative consequences of it, some strategies to combat it, and then what's helpful and not helpful. So every chapter we go over, we'll be hitting these points. And those are really good, too, because depending on how you define some of these terms... It's easy to say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Right. But then um, we'll get into those statements, but they do, some of them sting a little bit, and you're like, oh, well. Must be me. Strong, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing I do. Whoops, this chapter screaming at me. Chapter one. They don't waste time feeling sorry for themselves. Self-pity is easily the most destructive of the non-pharmaceutical narcotics. It's addictive, gives momentary pleasure, and separates the victim from reality. John Gardner. I know. I mean, if you think about it, 
Who's the Eeyore of the friend group? Or of the workplace. Or of or your of children. The, or of the Facebook feed, yes. <laughs> Who's the Eeyore and you're just like, oh my gosh, I gotta turn, I, I gotta unfollow, or you can't unfollow your child, but you can <laughs> <laughs> That's called neglect. Oh, uh, yeah, don't do that, but maybe work them through it. Or, you know, this is great. So if you are in a situation where, let's say, your kid or a student you're working with, or your spouse, or it might be you, it tells you how to combat this so you can work through this with the people you love. All right, so let's get into it. These are some statements that might resonate with you. So you tend to think your problems are worse than anyone else's. Mm-hmm. So she gives, do you want to just say a couple of each? Mm-hmm. Okay. One that stuck out to me was, you're fairly certain that no one else truly understands how hard your life really is. You often complain about things not being fair. You struggle to find anything to be grateful for sometimes. You're more likely to tell people what went wrong during your day rather than what went well. Now, I knew, no, I read some of those sassy, but let me just tell you. <laughs> I find um, one of my children in particular to be just spiraling in these from time to time. It's Gabby. And so... <laughs> <laughs> Not to name names, but it's definitely Gabby. Who's three. And I get it. I get it. But her new favorite thing is to say she's never gotten to whatever. So if we ask her to stop talking for one minute, she'll be like, but I never get to talk. And she talks all the time. So mm. it's So fun. side note, there's a rule we have in the Collier household, and it's don't speak in absolutes. Yep. Because we definitely did this probably the first couple of years of our marriage. Like, I would say, you never blah, 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 blah. Or, or he would say, you always blah, 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 blah. And so we once... Farron and I talked more about fair fighting and all this kind of stuff. It, we realized, don't speak in absolutes because nothing's ever, never, or always, except for the love of Jesus Christ and your salvation and that kind of stuff. Everything else, don't speak in absolutes. I was telling my brother-in-law, I never speak in absolutes. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, except... Never? Like, you never <laughs> speak in absolutes. So I was like, oh my gosh, I've said that to so many people. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> Have someone call it out of you. I usually don't speak in absolutes. I try to not. I try very hard to never speak in ah. absolutes. <laughs> it never just needs oh. to be there. Man, so if you do have that Eeyore friend, or you are the Eeyore, because it's kind of like the Enneagram checklist that we read off. And it, you're like, ooh, this one hurts my soul. It's probably you. So we're going to talk about how to combat that, and we definitely have some resources for you that will help you there. So the next section she talks about, um, it's the negative consequences that's going to happen if you are a pity party person. It makes me think of everybody has a party, every party has a pooper. Everybody mm. has a pooper, that's why we invited you. Party poop there. <laughs> Something like that. I think that's right. Well, I think it's good to hear what we're about to share because she does point out that it can buy... Some people stew in self-pity because it kind of buys you time. Enneagram force. Yeah, so instead of have, having to take action or move forward, you can temporarily convince yourself that it's just too much or it's against you and it's not even your fault, so why... Why should you be the one responsible to deal with it? So right. here, here is why it uh, hinders living a full life. Man, do you ever feel like, man, there, there's there got to be more. There's got to be more to life than just what I'm doing right now. So you can always check yourself like, mm, this, what were you thinking about right before that? Were you having a pity party, even if it was in your head, by yourself, in your office? Could be. It also, another reason to not have pity parties, it leads to more negative emotions. I know as a one, when it is, if I don't capture my thoughts, it is very easy for me to spiral out of control with just toxic things that aren't even accurate. So if you struggle with that too, our Guya miniseries would just get out of your head. That's episodes 84 through 91. So if that is screaming at you, make sure you go download those episodes and that will help you. Uh, and then come back to this mini series. Yes, and it can also interfere with your relationships. Um, so I can't remember the book, but we've talked about it before that you might want to have a better friend group, um, and you might have these expectations of what it would look like. And so then the question to ask is, are you being that kind of friend? Because you're going to kind of attract what you put out there. Mm -hmm. And so if you are constantly in a state of self-pity, again, Eeyore is a great example. 
then you're probably only going to attract other Eeyores. Now, we all have our seasons, and we all sure. need a vent. And so we get that. We're not saying be fakely, sickening, optimistic all the time, but right. you need a friend like that. And we're saying don't stay, don't stay stuck. Don't stay stuck, yeah. But um, it can definitely interfere with your relationships. That's one that struck a chord with me as well, and that made me think of Tiffany Armstrong, that episode we did, episode 90. She is a self-defense expert, and she talked about, I mean, she... She is not sure what her Enneagram number is, but just picking it apart, I would say she is a two. But there was a phase in her life where she was just so unhealthy with that. And talking about, like, she'd always throw a pity party when she wasn't either getting the right attention or whatever. So um, go back to episode 90 and listen to that, and then you can hear how she overcame all of that. So that is what happens when you throw pity parties a little too much. Yeah, so let's get into how to combat that or ways to overcome those moments. And again, you can have those. We're human. But like Brooke said, again, don't stay stuck. Don't stay stuck. What I really like in each chapter also, she gives you questions to ask yourself. And I was trying to just pick like one or two. But every chapter is like, man, these are so good to ask yourself. So what's another way I could view my situation? What advice would I give a loved one who had this problem? Man, because if you were stuck... You wouldn't say, or if you came to me, Farron, and you were like, oh, I'm having this, 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 I wouldn't be like, well, I guess your life just sucks. Sorry. I would coach you up, talk it out. So why wouldn't you do that to yourself? And then what evidence do I have that I can get through this? And we've talked about this multiple times, especially in the Get Out of Your Head miniseries. How has God come through for you and has gotten you out of situations? So go back and think about all those victories. Yep. She also talks about... um, making a conscious effort to do something contrary to how you feel. And I've kind of used that. We just finished Atomic Habits, and so I've used that as my new cue. Um, When I'm like, I don't want to do the laundry, I'm like, that's my cue. Stand up and dump it in the washing Mm -hmm. machine. (laughs) (laughs) And so I've noticed that that, because eventually I'm going to do it anyways, but I will have wasted time and spent a lot of energy um, doing my self-pity party. So instead, do something contrary. So I, I use that as my new cue to just uh, do it's that. It's really good. She also talks, too, about use, combating with gratitude, mm-hmm. which I think we've mentioned that before. Not <laughs> only mentioning that, but we do have a gratitude journal that is out, ready for you to snatch up out of the world and write on it. So we'll be sure to link the gratitude journal. And Super that cute. It's absolutely right, contrary to a self-pity party. A yeah. self-pity party is looking at all the bad and so something exactly opposite would be starting to look for the good and if you don't want to look for the good if you don't want to look for the good in things then I would um encourage you to kind of dig deeper into why not yeah why not and she'll talk about this too as identifying the underlying emotion in it all Mm -hmm. so if you don't want to look for the good and you kind of find yourself not wanting to get out of it then what's what's at the root i like that there is also another section where it's common thoughts that lead to feelings of self-pity and we have some verses that kind of counteract it so things like i can't handle one more problem so on the reverse second corinthians twelve nine says and he said to me my grace is sufficient for you For the power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So if you're like, I can't handle one more thing. Okay, well, there's also this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Philippians 4.13. You might have heard it if you grew up in the church, but that's still a good one. Or if you're trying to help your littles memorize scripture, that's going to help too. Another thought that's toxic is good things always happen to everyone else. Bad things always happen to me. And there is Matthew 5.45, which says, it just talks about how it rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. Like, it's going to rain on everybody. Everybody has bad days. Everybody has good days. So get your umbrella. (laughs) (laughs) Invest in a good umbrella. The word of God would be great. Um, There's also, my life just gets worse all the time. No one else has to deal with this stuff. I just can't catch a break. And then 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide a way to escape so that you'll be able to endure it. And 1 Corinthians 15.57, But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So 
I mean, there's a million verses out there about how we're victorious in the end. And Paul, I guess it was episode 51. 51, that sounds right. In our Switch on Your Brain mini-series, talks about how if it's not good, it's not the end. So, or actually that was Everything is Figure Outable mini-series. Yes. Yeah. Well, I love when you pull scripture into all of this. I just sit here and stare at you as you say it. Um, and so, yeah, in Get Out of Your Head, she talked about combating negative thoughts with the truth. And a step possibly before that is um, recognizing your thought and not believing it. Yeah. Um, so she said something about uh, you don't have to believe every thought you think. And I was like, what? No one <laughs> Why did wow. someone say that like years and years ago? <laughs> if you need a devotional, our church currently is doing Truth Filled by Ruth Cho Simmons. And she talks about how specifically looking at verses whenever you're feeling a certain way. Because you don't have to believe every thought you think. That's the enemy trying to get you to spiral out of control whenever you can recognize, oh, no, it rains on everybody. So let me grab my umbrella, like you were saying, Farron. And something I tell my oldest when she's verbalizing how she's feeling or thinking I ask her, like, if she was nervous about going to church camp, are those feelings and thoughts coming from God? Would God want you to be scared and worried about going to church camp? Who do you think that's from? Right. And so, you know, she doesn't, she likes to be in control of things. And so the idea that the enemy was after her in that thought, she's like, oh, heck no. I mean, yeah. she didn't say that, but her face did. So, <laughs> Well, and that's, that's great that you're calling it out right now because then you've just given her a skill set. To where when she does have a thought, okay, well, let's think about that. Is that a good feeling or a bad feeling? Okay, well, God is good, so mm -hmm. he's not going to send the bad things. Okay, there's another section on how to combat. So you are throwing pity parties. Someone you love is throwing pity parties. We're trying to work out of it. And she gives you multiple amazing examples of what to do. And the first one on the list is, guess what? Keep a gratitude journal. Again, we have a pretty one for you. And we also talked about this one episode ago. If you can only find five minutes a day, great. That's five more minutes of journaling than you didn't have. I'm just thinking about to a time a day you recommended. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I edited that out. Because <laughs> I was like, that's it. <laughs> but it was hilarious. Oh. Yeah, and keeping a gratitude journal goes back to the idea of practicing before you need it. Right. So in the moment, it is not easy to think of what you're grateful for. But if you develop the habit of thinking of things you're grateful for, then it's kind of like a knee-jerk reaction. You just kind of respond with like, yeah, this moment sucks, but I'm so glad I have X, Y, and Z. Right. A bad five minutes does not equal a bad day. So keep that in mind. And even if you can't sit there and write something or if you're in traffic and it's not safe to write, Say it out loud. There's power in saying something that you're grateful for out loud and listening, listing it. You could even call a friend. Call us. We'll answer. Yay. I like, too, how she said, teach kids to be grateful. So, yes. it's like, do as I say, not as I do. But if you can teach it, then and then you're modeling it. And next right. thing you know, you're just doing it. That's what I like, too. It's not that you're just... If you're teaching something for our non-educators, it's not that you're just telling them what to do. You're showing them examples. You're modeling. That's the word that educators use, which means you're saying, okay, Sloan, we're going to practice gratitude. What is something that you're thankful for? But let me go first. I am super thankful for your beautiful smile and your sweetheart. What's something you're thankful for? So then she has something to go off with. Yeah. Or catching yourself... Um complaining and then following it up with but I am so glad that I yes. at least have yeah there's also research that if you six to one ratio something that helps offset it so if you complain out loud you need to say six things you're grateful for so keep that in mind or if you're trying to correct someone same thing in the education realm if you're like oh that was not right you need to tell them all the things they're doing right and then a reminder you mentioned that Farron you didn't call it a don't do this you mentioned, here are some things you're doing great, but don't forget this reminder, mm -hmm. because they forgot to do that part. Yes. Okay, here's some benefits of gratitude, which is great. So, all the more reasons to be grateful. People who feel gratitude don't, don't get as sick as often. Gratitude leads to more positive emotions. Gratitude improves social lives. I mean, if you are stuck in a rut, and you're feeling pity party-y, 
you're probably not going out and hanging out with people. But if you're grateful, it's going to get you out the door a little bit better. Yeah, and these aren't just um, feel-good statements. This actually came from the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. So it's research-based. Yeah. I like how this whole book is researched based because you don't have to be like, oh no, is this real? Because if you go to the very back, it's got all of her sources cited where she's getting all this. And she's wicked smart, so. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Well done. Okay, and then the last section, she always provides a what's helpful versus what's not helpful. And then, again, in the education world, we call that examples and non-examples. And we all need both sometimes because we know, sometimes we know what to do, but we don't realize the what not to do. If we just eliminated that, that would help propel us forward. Yes, and you might be in a life phase where it would seem easier to take something away than to add something on. So I like that, you know, you can either what's helpful, add something, or what's not helpful and try to take away, stop doing something else. Right, so one of the things that's helpful, again, she has a whole list, so we're not going to go through everything. Get the book for yourself so you can read it and take notes. But giving yourself a reality check so you don't exaggerate how bad the situation really is. Or if you speak in hyperboles a lot, eights, then you need to find someone who's going to help you not be so dramatic with what's going on. Brooke, what's a hyperbole? That's when you over-exaggerate, like, ugh, it's a thousand degrees in here. (laughs) Is it really a thousand degrees in here? It's not. It's probably 80 degrees. Is it a thousand? No. Or, oh, that was the worst day ever. Was it? Yeah. Was it the worst day ever? You've had a lot of worst day evers. Yeah. (laughs) You can't keep saying that. Okay, and so then what's not helpful is remaining passive about the situation and focusing on how you feel rather than what you can do. And so as a nine, we tend to be a little passive, and then we wonder why we find ourselves resenting so many things. (laughs) Nothing changes if nothing changes. Yes. So if you want to change, got to get there. That was also in Casey's episode. You aren't getting better because you don't truly want to get better. Mm-hmm. You like staying stuck, so there's that. And obviously, be thankful and have some gratitude in your life. Pow! All right, that wraps up the intro and in chapter one to 13 things mentally strong people don't do. Yes, please go get your copy of the book and join us here next week. Bye! We help hardworking Christian women get the growth they want by giving them the tools they need in order to have more joyful lives. We love providing our Christian-based personal growth podcast to our listeners at no cost. If you are enjoying the content, please consider supporting our mission by donating to our Patreon. We're a small team creating the show for our community by researching, recording, and producing the episodes ourselves. Any amount is greatly appreciated. Your support will help offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you can receive exclusive access. For more details on specific membership tiers, visit our Patreon page. Go to patreon.com forward slash witty and gritty. We've included the link in the show notes.